going just a little fast? Sally Fields trusted Burt Reynolds. Back in 1967, five months after the release of the Chevy Camaro, Pontiac released the Camaro's platform mate, the Firebird. Although it remained paired with the Camaro's F-body for its entire run, the Firebird had a much different look and style than the Camaro, and eventually became Pontiac's flagship for performance cars. The Firebird and its most well-known trim, the Trans Am, would become one of the most popular cars in pop culture of the 70s and 80s, thanks to roles in the Rockford Files, Smokey and the Bandit, and Knight Rider. But by the mid-90s, popularity of sport coupes was waning, and despite wild new styling in its last few years, the Firebird was gone after 2002. This is the story of the Pontiac Firebird. This is my old car. So a while back, I got a comment from a viewer complaining that I talked too much about the car in TV and movies, and not enough about the history of the car. The episode in question was, ironically, about another Pontiac, the Fiero. Is that a Pontiac Fiero strapped to a rocket engine? So if you agree with this guy, you may not like this Firebird episode, as there's no way I can't talk about how much many of us grew up watching this car on the big and small screen in the 70s and 80s. Seven, David, this is Baker. If you can hear me, we're heading north on 405 for National. Yes, I will still provide plenty of history info, but it will be interspersed with some of my favorite TV and movie clips, as it is a fact that many Firebird sales were a direct result of its many film and television roles. <laughs> boost, oh! The Firebird, as well as its F-body cousin, the Camaro, only exists thanks to one other car, the Ford Mustang. The success of the Mustang in 1965 caught GM off guard, and thanks to that car's name, the term pony car was born. GM quickly worked to design and develop a worthy rival and assigned the F-Body project to both Chevrolet and Pontiac. Back then, Pontiac was a few years into their turnaround as GM's performance division, thanks to successes like the Grand Prix and GTO. Much of that success came from the bold direction of John Z. DeLorean. Yes, that DeLorean, long before he created his controversial time-traveling wonder. Last night, Darth Vader came down from Planet Falcon and told me that if I didn't take Lorraine out, that he'd melt my brain. When the F-Body platform was announced, DeLorean had already been directing his team to work on a new two-seater, but the GM brass squashed that idea, as Chevrolet wouldn't allow a Pontiac alternative to the Corvette. So instead, they handed DeLorean a nearly complete 1967 Camaro design and asked him to create a Pontiac version. DeLorean wasn't thrilled with the idea of being constrained to modifying somebody else's design, but he still ran with it. The Firebird had unique body panels as compared to the Camaro, especially in the front end treatment, and was also 4 inches longer than the Camaro. This first generation of the Firebird started out with 5 different engine choices, 2 inline 6s and 3 V8s, the top end being the Pontiac Ram Air V8 that made 325 horsepower. The same engine was upgraded over the next couple years, topping out at 400 cubic inches and 6.6 .6 liters, making 345 horsepower. Starting in 1969, the top end trim offered was officially called the Trans Am Performance and Appearance Package, which would later be shortened to just Trans Am. The 69 Trans Ams all had a unique paint scheme of being white with blue bracing stripes. Only 697 were ever made, of which only 8 were convertibles. Overall, Firebird sales averaged around 90,000 each year from 1967 to 69, with the best year being 1968, with over 107,000 sold. The Trans Am name was borrowed, initially without approval, from the Sports Car Club of America's Trans American Championship Series that began in 1966. When the SCCA learned of GM's plan to use the Trans Am name, they threatened to sue. The GM managed to settle the dispute by agreeing to pay $5 to the SCCA for each Trans Am model sold. $5 in the late 60s is about $40 today, so that seems like a great deal for GM at the time, especially when you consider how the name Trans Am would easily become more well known for its association with Pontiac than as a racing series. The second gen Firebird started with a 1970 model year, although engineering delays forced it to be delayed a few months into 1970. With a door that makes getting into a sports car as easy as getting into a limousine. Despite other 1970 model year Pontiacs being available in the fall of 1969. This would be the longest running Firebird generation, lasting 11 years. It's also the only generation that ever offered a convertible. As this generation took place during the oil embargo, earlier models from before 1973 had larger V8 displacements, and the Trans Am models in particular from that era have become highly sought after by collectors. Along with the top end Trans Am, the Firebird could also be had in base, Esprit, and Formula trim. The Esprit was intended to be more luxury focused, whereas the Formula was a more affordable option to the Trans Am. The second gen models initially kept a similar grille design as the outgoing model, although with single headlamps on either side. The rear window was originally supposed to wrap around to form smaller B-pillars, 
but due to production difficulties, they had the rear window in the 1970 through 74 models extend directly back to the trunk lid. The largest displacement engine arrived for 1971 with a 7.5 liter V8, but it made 10 less horsepower than the 69 model's 6.6 liter offered. However, it was still comparable to the Corvette, which helped to put a 1971 model into the movie Corvette Summer, starring Mark Hamill, released just one year after a slightly more well-known movie role. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. The 71 Firebird was also well-known on the TV series Chips, as Poncha's daily driver, which of course, had a few mishaps along the way. And by 1973, the famous, or infamous depending on your point of view, Firebird decal, better known as a screaming chicken, was available on the Trans Am. New safety sanders resulted in redesigned bumpers and structural improvements for 1974, which changed the front end look of the car, along with new tail lamps and reduced engine output that got as low as 105 horsepower for the base V6. The 74 model also debuted as Jim Rockford's car on the Rockford Files that same year. The Firebird was chosen by the series star James Garner, who did many of the stunts himself. including the car's many J-turns, which the series became well known for. The 74 model in the show had the Esprit trim, but was upgraded to a Trans Am suspension for all the stunt work. For most of the subsequent seasons, Garner upgraded to newer Formula models each year. However, the outside trim was changed to match the look of the Esprit trim, as well as repainted to maintain the gold color of the original 74 Esprit. Improvements continued for the Firebird in 1976. and a special anniversary edition for Pontiac's 50th year. Removable T-tops designed by Hearst were also available for this anniversary model. But the next changes to the Firebird were become the most recognizable in terms of pop culture history, thanks to its role in the second top grossing movie of 1977, Smokey and the Bandit, starring the late great Burt Reynolds. I forgot to tell you, I'm uh, running blocker for 400 cases of illegal proof. The 77 models had a revised front end that swapped the dual round headlamps to quad square headlamps. Although Bandit's Trans Am was supposed to be a 1977 model, the four cars supplied by Pontiac were actually 1976 models, specially modified with the new square headlamp front end. This was done because the 77 models weren't officially available for sale during the movie's production, so GM supplied the new front end to help advertise the upcoming model. I'm going, I got the metal to the pedal and the thing to the floor. <laughs> Bandit's Trans Am was also labeled as 6.6 liter, which was true, except that unlike the 6.6 liter from 1969, which made over 300 horses, the 1976 and 77 models only made 200 from the same displacement, thanks to all the emission controls mid-70s cars were forced to endure. Pontiac even supplied Le Mans models for cop cars, piloted in hilarious fashion by the great one, Jackie Gleason. Burt Reynolds was so pleased with the performance of the Trans Am that he insisted on it again for his next movie, Hooper, in 1978. One of the movie's most famous scenes involves a rocket booster installed to allow the car to literally fly, although it's not too hard to tell that the car used in the stunt isn't a Firebird. In fact, it wasn't even a real car, but instead a scale model. But this was the late 70s, and audiences were much more easily fooled back then. With continued decreases in engine output, by 1980, the top-of-the-line V8 was 4.9 liters and had a turbocharger, and yet still couldn't achieve more than 210 horses. Despite this, a 1980 model was used for the first Smokey and the Bandit sequel, but in order to achieve the speed they needed for some of the stunts, a nitrous tank was installed to give it the extra burst of speed. With the first movie doing so well at the box office, Pontiac was more than happy to supply several more cop cars in the sequel, including a Parisienne for Buford. Are you all right, Junior? Yeah. You would be you and several Le Mans for the climactic scene in the desert. After hitting a peak of over 211,000 sold in 1979, including being the pace car for the 1979 Daytona 500, sales dropped by half for 1980, and only around 70,000 for 1981. But behind the scenes, GM was working on an all-new F-Body platform to introduce a new Camaro and Firebird for 1982. Whereas the Camaro switched from its dual round headlamps to quad square headlamps and kept a more squared off look that was typical for the early 80s, Pontiac made a significant effort to make the Firebird look much different, more streamlined, and for the time, more futuristic. Underneath, the F-Body was around 500 pounds lighter than the outgoing model, thereby allowing the fuel-saving engines to offer a bit more power. Some of that weight loss was due to the car being 8 inches shorter than the previous generation, making the back seat not a real fun place to be. 
These were also the first Firebirds to have a large window hatch in the rear, and the windshield was raked at 62 degrees, three degrees steeper than any other GM car up to that point. Even the Firebirds rear spoiler was more than just for show and aided in aerodynamics, but its biggest selling point was its pop-up headlamps, which became so synonymous with the Firebird that they remained on all future models, even long after composite headlamps were available on most all other cars, rendering pop-ups unnecessary. Pontiac's new Firebird. Now the excitement really begins. Again, there were four different trims, with the only change being the Esprit name changing to SE, but it was still considered the luxury model. The screaming chicken decal on the hood was gone, considered a relic of the overly flamboyant 70s. If you got the cheapest version of the base model, you got a 90 horsepower inline four-cylinder, the Iron Duke, the smallest engine ever offered for the Firebird. The Trans Am remained for the top trim, but it almost got changed to just T slash A, so Pontiac could stop paying royalties to the SCCA for using the Trans Am name. To help market the new generation Firebird, Pontiac offered several copies for a new TV action series in 1982 called Knight Rider. With the whole plot of the show based around a futuristic car named Kit that could talk, K I T T for easy reference, drive itself, and provide closed circuit camera views where no cameras exist, they needed the most futuristic looking car available, and the Firebird, especially the Trans Am, fit the bill. Modified to have a unique extended nose complete with super cool strobe light, the show's human star may have been David Hasselhoff, but thanks to actor William Daniels supplying Kit's voice, the car was the star. And like all TV cars of the 80s, it could jump vast distances without a single scratch. Thanks in no small part to its popularity on Knight Rider, the Trans Am was yet again selected as pace car for the Daytona 500 in 1983, and 2,500 pace car replicas were up for sale. Sales increased over 128,000 for 1984, the best sales year for the third gen, and included a 15th anniversary model for the Trans Am, with the same white and blue color scheme as the first Trans Am in 1969. For 1985, the refreshing provided new rocker panels and revised front and rear, and the Trans Am's hood bulge was replaced with new functional heat exhaust vents. 1986 introduced an updated dashboard and an optional louvered rear window. This was also the year that the Iron Duke four-cylinder was dropped, with a 2.8 liter V6 being the base model engine. Sadly, the 305 cubic inch V8 in the Trans Am still only made 210 horsepower. And sadly, all the great advertising of the car from Knight Rider only lasted into 1986, as even Super Pursuit Mode couldn't keep that show on the air. 1987 introduced the option of a Chevrolet 5.7 liter 350 cubic inch V8, available in the new Trans Am GTA that was similar to what was offered in the C4 Corvette, making performance numbers similar, but just shy of the Corvette, as Chevrolet wouldn't allow Pontiac to be faster than their flagship model. In 1987 was the first year that American Sunroof Corporation, or AFC, offered a Firebird and Camaro convertible. However, the extra weight of the convertible, when paired with the larger engines in the Trans Am and GTA, forced a $1,200 gas guzzler tax, and in turn, meant that Pontiac wouldn't directly offer the convertible from the dealer, even though the conversion was identical to the Camaro. For 1989, Pontiac offered for the first time a Turbo V6 for the Trans Am, an improved version over the one used in the Buick Grand National. Officially called the TTA for Turbo Trans Am, it was chosen as pace car for the Indianapolis 500. Although its official horsepower rating was 250, testing by car and driver made it clear the actual horsepower was likely closer to 300, making it the fastest GM production car, although only by a technicality, as a faster Corvette ZR1 wasn't officially in production until the 1990 model year. As 1989 was also the Trans Am's 20th anniversary, there were some anniversary models available on the Trans Am GTA. By 1991, another refreshing resulted in an all-new nose that was similar to the Banshee show car that teased the look of the upcoming 4th gen model. These models also had new ground effects along the side. The bold, new style and legendary performance of the 1991 Pontiac Firebird. The line must be drawn here! These changes improved the aerodynamics enough to allow the convertible to finally be ordered through dealers, although still converted by ASC. But performance fans remember this as the first year of the Firehawk, produced by SLP Engineering, a modified version of the formula that boosted horsepower to 350. Little was done to the Firebird for 1992, as the fourth gen debuted for 93. With the base Firebird offering the V6, the formula in Trans Ams got the 5.7 liter LT1 from the C4 Corvette, although with more restrictive airflow to keep it from being faster than the base Corvette. The Firehawk returned for 93, but was slightly less powerful at 300 horsepower, although by the end of the Firebird in 2002, the horsepower rating made it back up to 345. 
However, visually the biggest change came in 1997 for the 98 model year with an all new hood and front fascia that really emphasized the pop-up headlamps, now larger to accommodate quad halogen headlamps. However, this redesign also meant the end of the convertible as overall sales were decreasing each year, leading to lots of rumors of the Firebird and Camaro maybe nearing their end. This finally came true for 2002 and Pontiac offered a collector's edition that year. With the loss of the Firebird in 2002 and other embarrassments like the Aztec, and continued rebadging of Chevrolet models, Pontiac was losing ground and eventually succumbed to GM's bankruptcy by 2010. However, Chevrolet reintroduced the Camaro for model year 2010, and as a result, there were several attempts to reimagine a Firebird using the newer Camaro body as a starting point. The Camaro has remained in the Chevy lineup at least through the recording of this video in 2023, although its current sixth generation is expected to end in 2024, as sales have been dropping for years. Despite that, if you ask me, the cooler of the two cars has always been the Firebird as I am sure many fans will agree. Thanks for watching. God damn, it's a Texas Mountie. What the hell is he doing in Arkansas? If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid-2000s that you rarely see today, and would like it featured in a future episode, Big take it easy. I may be old, but I'm not ready to die yet. Leave a reply in the comments, or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time.